Hello gamers and welcome back to another special episode of Solo Spelunking because I'm on vacation and um, I still found that the YouTube bug has bitten me and I got some time on my hands because my girls, my wife and my two daughters they're out horseback riding and getting uh, riding lessons and this is something I'm really not into so I got some time to make a short video and what I want to do is um, first of all I want to show you my mobile traveling or my mobile gaming kit that I brought with me on this vacation um, and then I will talk a little bit about what I'm going to play while I'm on vacation and have some time on my hands. So um, this setup you see here is all the stuff I took with me for gaming and I will go over the components. So you already know my, my dice tray and this dice tray you can basically unfold it so it is uh, nice and flat and light and you can even roll it up so it really does not take uh, take up much space so um, yeah I got that one with me my dice tray and this is my um, yeah my carry on or, or carry with me traveling GM kit which basically contains everything you need to run whatever game um, as long as you got the rules uh, someplace uh, in a PDF and I usually uh, look up the rules on my phone but uh, since I'm using my phone now to record uh, part of my gaming stuff is also a tablet that I will show that contains the uh, rules documents for whatever game you can think of and so this is just a, a bag and it contains three sets of polyhedral role-playing dice. Two of them I got a nice bag and the third one is just packed in this little Ziploc bag. These are usually uh, the dice I use for the for the NPCs and the monsters. The orange-gray ones and these nice packaged ones are usually the ones that I use for my hero. So these are complete um, RPG dice sets consisting of seven dice each. Then of course a trusty Lamy fountain pen. This is a different one than I got in my gaming den. I got one in my gaming den that always stays there and usually one that I take with me and I do my everyday riding with it. And so um, I always carry one with me. So that's that. Then of course two pencils and a pencil sharpener. And one fell already fell out I got three extra ink cartridges for my Lamy fountain pen so this is basically the writing stuff and the rest of the bag I show to you consists of several more six-sided dice but also an assortment of different tokens so I have these little wooden board game pawn figures. I got four different colors, four pawns each. So that is 16 pawns. That is more than enough to represent any sort of tactical combat situation. I usually take a fancy mini with me for my character. This one here is Star Wars themed miniature and the fitting spaceship from Micro Machines. But this is only for my PC. All the other um, enemies are represented either by wooden cardboard pawns or by these wooden dice cubes. Uh, of course, I always I also need an eraser. So basically, this is an assorted bag of, of different colored and different sized six-sided dice as well because you can never have too many of these. And mostly just little pawns and, and tokens. Um, these are from a uh, roulette gaming set, also little plastic tokens. So this is um, all I need for whatever form of tactical representation I might uh, want to do while I'm playing solo while traveling. So, and it all packs up nicely in this bag right here. 
So this is usually this in conjunction with a journal what I take with me. But we are not done yet. So that's that is my, my bag and <laughs> it's a little Star Wars theme here that I drew in there. So these are bags that you could basically just craft yourself. And I got the little book of battle mats um, from Loki Battle Mats, the Dungeon Edition. And these books of battle mats, they're a great product. So you find double-sided lay flat maps here for some iconic um, gameplay situations. Oh, I can see there's a reflection here. So let me get this up like this maybe. So um, yeah, this is the little book of battle mats by Loki Battle Mats, the Dungeon Edition. This um, I usually don't take this with me, but if I'm on a longer vacation, it uh, does not hurt. So this is actually one of the core elements, Trusted Journal. Um, this is a high quality one, a Leuchtturm 1917 journal. It usually, this journal, it's like 20 bucks, but I got this on a clearance sale for 10 bucks. And my honest opinion is, and I'm sorry Leuchtturm, but this journal is not worth 20 bucks. 10 bucks, it's all right, but 20 bucks is way too much. Why is that? All right, so it comes with all the neat features. It's got a, a rubber band here. It's got two ribbons and it also got a, it's also got a back pocket to store some stuff and it comes with stickers. This one is lined. They also come and dot it. It's got numbered pages and a table of content section, but the paper, this is 80 grams per, I think it's square meter, 80 grams um, paper. And it is a little thin. So if you write uh, with a fountain pen, as you can see here, I did, um, it sometimes shines through. And I think people that buy expensive notebooks, they also use fancy writing implements. And 80 grams is just not thick enough if you are charging 20 bucks for a notebook. So it should be, I think 100 grams is the sweet spot. 120 grams is a little too thick. you got very sharp edges. 80 grams is all right if you pay like from, I say like from five to eight, maybe to 10 bucks for a notebook. But if they charge 20 bucks for a notebook, regular price, um, you, can't, you can't do that. It's gotta be at least um, 100 grams or should have been 100 grams. So my verdict is, I'm sorry, that I will not buy these notebooks at their regular price. For me, it's not worth it for the price they're charging for it. But I'm also not in the paper business and, and paper industry, so maybe I'm completely wrong and it is very expensive to produce these notebooks, I don't know. But this is just my personal opinion. But for 10 bucks, it is a very nice looking high quality notebook. And these uh, sheets that came out of it are the ones that I use for all game systems. So this is, you already know that, my generic uh, battle grid for whatever combat situations. Then I got the, um, from Jensen Vars, the uh, scene unfolding machine, parts of it at least, because it comes with very nice action subject and adjective tables as a random idea generator. And they can be used to generate encounters and all kinds and answer all kinds of questions. So I got these in here. This is my character for what I'm currently playing. I will get into this in a minute. And the trusty one page mythic GM emulator. If you don't have anything but this page, you could still run whatever game because it's also got some generic action and description tables. It's got an Oracle. It's got a mechanic for random events. So this is also um, what I have in and usually they're all just inside this notebook. And you see a map here. This is a hex crawl map that I generated using the rules of my Untamed Wilds game. But I'm not playing this game here. I just used this map for um, the fantasy game I'm currently playing sort of as my 
private vacation uh, off camera game but i will give you a little insight into that so um yeah this is the area i'm currently in this town here of of del mar and i just won a great um card game tournament <laughs> with my character so but we're not done with the set yet this is um just a, a notebook with uh, where you can tear out the pages and i use this if i need to create small dungeon maps or character sheets or whenever you need a small piece of of paper so um this is also in my in my traveling kit and this is of course an important item this is my tablet which i use of course to watch movies and and stream videos watch youtube but also it includes all the pdfs um, of whatever game system i want to play at the moment and they're all legally obtained so there's no pirated stuff in here it's either it was either available for free or bought from drive through rpg um so yeah this is this notebook uh, this um tablet and if i'm not doing videos i only need my phone because um um, there I also got these these PDFs. So this is it. This is my mobile traveling gaming kit and with this kit I can basically run every game every setting anywhere So and it all folds up very nice and has a very small form factor So this is it and now the second thing I want to talk about in this video is what am I actually playing while I'm on vacation. And um, I am playing an ultra light, well I couldn't, wouldn't really call it a, a variant because it is only inspired by a core mechanism. So um, I'm playing an ultra light version or a not a version, a, a Dagger Heart inspired ultra light RPG that I'm testing, and I have um, named it Lighthearted because it is inspired by the Dagger Heart task resolution. But like I said, ultra light, this is why I'm calling it Lighthearted, and it's a minimalist RPG. And I'll show you the character sheet for the character that I made with it, and then I'll get a little bit into the system so of course i'm playing a rogue and uh, this is ryu human rogue and you see the character sheet it does not include much he's got hit points here he's got six out of six he's got resolve which is my uh, version of hope just so that i don't get uh, maybe into any copyright trouble if i show you this stuff here so this is resolve i currently have one point of resolve you start with two i have a light armor which has three armor points my defensive score this is how hard it is to hit me is 11 and my skills or tags are agile fencer charming to the last rooftop ac rooftop acrobat nimble pickpocket insightful and silver tongued scoundrel and i think from these skills or tags uh, you get a pretty good idea of what i can do or what i'm good at so um this minimalistic system does not feature attributes and here i got my gear so i just imported the gear slot system i have 12 gear slots I carry three daggers, which take up one slot, a rapier, which takes up one slot. I got light leather armor, which takes up a slot. My trusty adventurer spell, never leave home without it. And an adventurer's pack, which in its entirely entirety takes up four inventory slots. And I have 85 gold pieces. I started with 10 and I needed five gold pieces to enter this uh, card gaming tournament which i won when i played yesterday so and the prize money was 80 gold so <laughs> now i'm at 80 gold pieces so this is the character sheet now you have a little bit of context and i will just shortly introduce to you my ultra light system all right so why was it inspired by daggerheart because i like the task resolution system of rolling 2d12 
and this is also be because I think the d12 is a very aesthetic die. I like rolling a d12. It looks nice and it is underused and underrated in my opinion. So um, I really liked uh, the fact that I could roll 2d12 while playing the Daggerheart Quick Start Adventure. So I incorporated this task resolution roll mechanic. So, um, so now what is lighthearted, like I said, a minimalist RPG. So characters, they only, they don't have attributes. Uh, they start with six skills or tags. And these are short sentences or words that describe an area of expertise. And I give a few examples, for example, sword play, nimble as a cat, silver tongued, arcane spellcaster, etc. So you use these tags or skills to define your character and to give him abilities, areas where he's good at. So um, this is um, yeah, how you basically build your character. Then every character starts with six hit points. Every character starts with two resolve and you can have a maximum of six resolve at any given time. Then you have a defensive score, and this score determines how difficult it is to hit you in combat. And uh, contrarily to armor class, because there's always this misconception that they say, all right, so armor makes you harder to hit. No. In Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons, and in most systems that use armor class, armor class is not a measure of how hard you are to hit. It is how difficult it is to hit a blow that inflicts damage, that impacts you in any way, that impairs you in any way. So if you have a high armor class because of your agility, that might mean that you're indeed harder to hit. But if you have a high armor class because you wear heavy armor, like a shield and plate, and you have like AC, whatever, 18, 19, 20, I would assume that most of the attacks actually hit you but you would probably parry most of them with your shield or they hit maybe your with plate protected areas of the body and do not uh, deal any damage so this is the the abstract thing that and i always hear armor makes you harder to hit no armor makes it harder to land an impacting solid blow that affects you but not here here defensive score exactly means that uh, how hard are you to hit? So determines how difficult it is to hit them in combat. So without armor, because you're light and agile and fast, you have a defensive score of 12. If you wear light armor, like my character does, you have a defensive score of 11. If you wear medium armor, you have a defensive score of 10. And if you have heavy armor, you have a defensive score of only 9. And you have this advantage on all non-combat task rolls that rely on speed, stealth, grace, or other physical feats. So here indeed, if you are heavy armored, you are somewhat lighter to hit, but you can also take more punishment, and I will come to that in a minute. So task resolution, to succeed at any given task that has a chance of failure, you roll 2d12 in different colors and you add the numbers together and compare that to a target number. And if you meet or beat that number, you succeed. And now we get to the two different colors and this is inspired by Daggerheart. You have a resolve die and a despair die. And if your, your resolve die is higher, you roll with resolve and you get one point of resolve. You start with two, you can have a maximum of six. If the despair die is higher, uh, one despair is put into the despair pool, which starts at zero and can have a maximum value of 10. And this is the resource used by the GM or solo GM and the monsters and NPCs. And if both dice show the same number, it is a critical success, which means the task is successful. You gain one resolve. If it was an attack and combat, you deal plus one damage, and you also regain or heal one hit point if you have taken damage. And only player characters have resolve and regain HP when rolling a critical success. And NPCs and monsters here also roll 2d12 for task resolution. 
but they don't use the armor mechanic so we get to that monsters npcs they might have armor in cinematic in a cinematic way when you describe them but they don't use the armor mechanic and they also don't have tags instead you use despair to enhance their roles and if an npc or monster makes a task resolution roll with 2d12 you disregard the resolve and despair die mechanic you just roll 2d12 and add the numbers it's just so that you have one constant system across the board but this resolve and despair is a player facing mechanic and um yeah so um Resolve is a player resource and Despair is a GM NPC monster resource. And only player roles can generate Resolve or Despair, so not NPC roles. And so what do you need Resolve for? So if you're a hero, you can Resolve for the following. You can spend one Resolve to use one of your skills or tags during a task resolution role, a tag role or spellcasting role if it fits and if you use a skill or tag it grants you advantage on the roll and advantage works as described in Daggerheart you roll a d6 and add it to the result and this advantage on the other hand you roll a d6 with your 2d12 and subtract it from the result and you can only use a skill or tag if you have resolve to spend and you start with two resolve and you can generate them like I said so if, uh, if I want to use my Agile Fencer um, tag as Ryu and I want to get advantage on an attack roll with my Rapier, I would have to spend a Resolve and then I would roll 2d12 plus 1d6 for the attack roll. So this is how you use your skills and tags. Um, you can, and now we get to the armor mechanic, you can spend one resolve to redirect the damage from any attack, trap or other external source into your armor, reducing your armor points instead of your hit points. So every piece of armor or every category of armor has armor points, light armor has three points, medium armor five and heavy armor has seven points. So if you would take one, two or three points of damage, you could spend a resolve and redirect this damage directly into your armor. And armor can be repaired, but it is a, a difficult and, and long process, so you can just do it like uh, in a dungeon. So you need some sort of facility and time and materials to repair your armor. But you also need to have resolve to redirect the damage from an attack into your armor. So resolve is like this metagaming currency that you can use for a lot of things. All right, you can spend one resolve to heal or regain one hit point. You can spend one resolve to grant advantage to the role of an ally, only an ally, not yourself. For yourself, you need a fitting tag or skill. And you can spend one resolve to deal plus one damage on a hit. And there's no limit on the number of resolve you can spend. And spending resolve is not an action. So it's a metagame thing you do. And despair is basically the opposite for the GM or monsters. And you can spend it to grant advantage to a monster or NPC to their role. You can spend a despair to deal plus one damage on a hit. You can spend two despair to grant one opponent an additional turn in combat. And you can spend two despair to impose disadvantage on a hero's um, task resolution role. And this disadvantage and advantage cancel each other out. All right, so this is basically the, the basic mechanic. Um, now combat uh, is played conventionally in rounds. And here um, I... Um, imported the card-based initiative mechanic from Daggerheart that I like because I like this physical aspect of drawing and turning a card and um, so you draw initiative cards every round every player hero gets a card and every opponent side gets a card so if you have like two or three similar monsters they would get one card and other monsters get a different card and if the GM spends two despair to grant a, a certain monster an additional turn, this monster gets an additional 
um, initiative card, just like in, in Dragon Bane when you have this army of one ability, but um, not the entire group. So you got to pick one monster, so it makes sense to grant this ability to important NPCs or bosses. And it also costs two to spare. So then turn order is determined by drawing cards, and you resolve them low to high, so they're numbered 1 to 10. And it is redrawn at the start of every round. So, and the damage is very simple. Every weapon causes only one point of damage on a hit. A critical hit causes plus one damage, and you can always spend resolve or despair to deal plus one damage as well. So damage usually ranges from one standard to maybe two if you spend despair or resolve, and in in um, certain cases three if you combine that with a critical hit. So this is how damage works and like I said you can use resolve to redirect the damage completely into your armor. Every damage absorbed cancels one armor point. So basically a leather armor could absorb three normal one point hits and a heavy armor could absorb up to seven or then the equivalent of, of critical hits. And to repair armor you need supplies, time and a proper workshop. It can normally not be done in the field. However, um, there might be exceptions and um, you always need resolve to use your armor. Then spell casting is a little bit free form. So if you want to be able to cast a spell, you need a fitting tag. You don't need to use your tag always to, to cast. But if you want to be able to cast, you need a tag, like Arcane Spellcaster or Divine Cleric or Force Wielder if you play in a sci-fi or Psionic or whatever. So yeah, like I said, you do not necessarily need to spend resolve to cast. You just need the tag. And to cast, you make a normal 2d12 task resolution roll, and the difficulty is determined by the desired effect. So this is free form. You could plug in a spell list basically from whatever system if you wanted to. And if you fail your task resolution roll, or you succeed, but you roll with despair, you suffer one point of spell burn, or you could also call it exhaustion if you, if you don't use spells. And if you have a total of three spell burn or exhaustion, you need to rest before you can cast again. And a long rest, whatever that might be in your system, removes all spell burn or um, exhaustion. Yeah, so this is basically this, this very light system I came up with. I just wanted to uh, have something to incorporate this 2d12 task resolution mechanic. And I'm testing this system right now. And uh, so you can see here uh, my character Ryu, he already gained and spent uh, resolve. And, and I used this resolve for the roles I had in my card game tournament. And um, there I used my insightful tag because it's like it, it's like bluffing and intuition and um, reading your opponent because it was a card game. And um, yeah, so this is what I did here in my in my private game that I'm playing here, and I'm recording this. So <laughs> here you see this is uh, the holiday edition. Yeah, I'm playing the Untamed Wilds, so I I journeyed a little, and then I this was basically um, random. So um, I was in a tavern, and um, I just asked the question here. I'm reading to you. I want to take part in some gambling and keep my eyes open. So I asked the oracle, is there some gambling going on? And I wrote an exceptional yes. And I interpreted this as a tournament being held that night in this tavern. So I put down, what a coincidence. As the thought crossed my mind, a big card game tournament that will start tonight at 2000 hours 8 p.m. is announced. I want to enter and walk up and speak to the announcer. Then I was asking the question if I had enough money to enter because I only had like 10 gold pieces. And then again I wrote an exceptional yes. So I ruled it is only 5 gold pieces to enter. So I paid my fee and I'm in. 
and because I needed, uh, I rolled this, but then I rounded up because I needed uh, uh, divisible by two number of people. A total of 16 people are in the tournament, so there were 80 gold pieces to win. And so the first round had all 16 people, it was elimination. Second round, eight people, four people, and then the remaining two people. And those were the target numbers I needed to win the round. 10, 11, 12, and 15. So they got more difficult. And here you see uh, win with despair, despair, despair. And by my automatic uh, GM rules, um, it is so that whenever I have despair, I need or have to spend it on the next opportunity. So here I had to spend those two despair to impose disadvantage. So I had to use my resolve for advantage to cancel it out. And then I had to make a normal 2d12 roll without any advantage, disadvantage, and no bonuses, and I needed to hit 15, which was pretty difficult, but here you see it, I rolled a crit, two nines, 18, and a critical success. And so uh, I put down here, I win my way into the final round of the tournament. So far it was very intense, but this final match is something else. The entire tavern crowd gathers around our table. You could cut through the air. The tension is high. It comes down to the last hand. With an iron stare and a streak of good fortune, I win the tournament and the prize money of 80 gold pieces. So, and this is where I, I left. And this is where I will be picking up this session. And maybe I will make a video about it while I'm on vacation. Maybe not. Maybe I just recap like I do now I just wanted to yeah to give you a little update of what I'm up to so I will end this video here um, yeah and I hope all of you are well as always stay safe and stay healthy and thanks again for your interest and following and watching and I'll see you in the next video bye bye